Mr. Pond Boss. Tell Here we go, going live. To make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust coming at you from a uh, seriously raining North Texas up here. It's uh, raining like crazy, boy. We got a severe thunderstorm going on. Let's see Jason Nepstad up to bat. Surprise! Hi, Jason. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, man, we're right in the middle of a severe thunderstorm. You'll probably hear some thunder and see some lightning here in the background here in a minute. I see Jacob West checking in. Good to see Jacob. If it ain't raining on you in a minute, buddy, it will be because it's coming right over us, headed right toward you. Hi, Todd Austin. Good to see you. Our, uh, our internet's been down for the last few minutes here, so I'm living off... Uh, Oh, looks like it might be connected now. I've been living off of the phone cell signal, which is kind of weak here. But tonight's topic, somebody told me about an hour ago that we're going to be talking about trade secrets to growing bigger fish. Huh. I don't know who came up with that, but I like it. Dave Weber, who's going to be first in tonight? Say hi, Bob. <laughs> Yeah, my Cottrell, stop raining. Yeah, I hear what that means because it's uh, it's really coming down here, guys. It's it's growing, going fast. I don't know what, it's probably one of those two to three inches an hour rainfall events, but there's some pretty high winds just blowing. And, you know, being a being a pond guy, I, I never, ever say don't rain. It'd be okay if it paused for about a month so we could get some work done. The guys are out delivering tilapia right now, and they're right in the middle of this long line of showers and there's probably going to be probably going to be a tornado somewhere around here today i don't know you know within 50 miles or 100 miles but anyway let's get down to business let's start talking about trade secrets to growing bigger fish trade secrets let me think about that in a minute you know if you talk to a deer person what they're going to tell you is they're going to tell you to have the best habitat the best genetics food and time well, that pretty well applies to your fish as well. Uh, you know, the guys that grow the biggest deer really understand that. Now, I gotta tell you, it's a lot easier to grow big deer than it is to grow big fish, mainly because you can see them. There's Willie Howe checking in. Is it raining on you, Willie? <laughs> Aren't you glad you're not in that RV anymore? Woo! Fred Bingaman checking in. Mike Rose is on board. John Funk, hi from a very wet Michigan, mid-Michigan. You know what? It's pretty wet here, too. Our average annual rainfall around here is around 35, 38 inches, 38, something like that. And I think so far, we've got about 13 inches this year. So we got quite a bit. Sonny Mitchell here, new magazine subscriber. Thank you very much. That's great. Going to pick your brain later in the show about my five-acre Alabama pond. Love your video. Well, let's, let's start picking brains. Let's go. On a... Uh, some of the trade secrets to uh, growing bigger fish. Oh, by the way, by the way, don't forget, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Share it to your timeline right now and click like. You do those three things, you're going to be eligible for a Pond Boss hat and a, a mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. So uh, we haven't had a drawing the last couple of weeks. I meant to tell Leanne to, to do a drawing, and she did. I, I, I forgot to tell her, so... We didn't do it, so we'll do it next week. Leanne, if you're watching, help me remember that. Let's see, John Funk's pond's overflowing. You only got an inch and a half. That's a lot. Jason Hoffman, we're in year two at a new-to-us pond. Stocked bluegill, largemouth bass, channel cat. We had an explosion of bluegill at the feeder this spring, five times more than last year. But I'll be darned, we can't catch a channel cat fish or a bass to save our lives. Maybe they're full on all the small gills. That could very well be. You know, I don't know how many you stocked. And how big your pond is. So uh, I tell you what happens, and this 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 isn't a trade secret, but it's common sense. When you when you stock a pond properly, I see Scott Serio checking in. Scott's a Purina dealer over near uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. If you get a chance to stop by and see him, he carries all the Aquamax products, and he's got his own ponds. So Scott knows how to play the game. He understands that. Speaking of that, I love Purina. Uh, I love their attitude about our industry. I love that they're receptive and inquisitive and that they want to create the best products. And I think they've done a pretty dead gum good job of that. And I, that's what I use. I use Purina Feeds. I use all the Aquamax products, especially the Game Fish 
not the game fish, but the um, oh come on, let's MVP Aquamax 500, 600, the fish meal based products. Those are outstanding. You're a really really big fish. Jason Nepstad thinks he won last week's drawing. You hadn't won one yet, dude. You have to. You're on here all the time. I see Jeff Patterson checking in. It's a birthday boy today. Happy birthday, Jeff. Dion Myers, Fred Bigaman did it. All right. Let's see here. Let me see what else we got here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, so let's let's talk about growing huge fish, growing bigger fish. Let's go back to the uh, example of the uh, what I was going to say a while ago. When you stock a pond properly, you got to keep in mind, I've told you this a hundred times, raise your hand if you've heard this. How many pounds of bait fish does it take to grow a pound of game fish? Oh, I hear everybody screaming at their, at their screens. 10 pounds of bait fish. So you're in the bait fish business if you're going to grow bigger fish. But what if you want to grow your bait fish bigger? What's the trade secrets to that? Well, the game is you got to look at there. Jason's chiming and he knew it. So you start your food chain off and you give them a chance to expand. So when I hear somebody say, my bluegill are blowing up at the feeder, that's a great sign because what that means is your food chain is expanding. And as your food chain expands and those bluegill get bigger, they're going to be the brood fish to help supply the babies to feed your game fish later. And since you're feeding them, if you're feeding them a really, really good fish food like Purina's MVP, you're going to see rapid growth rates and ultimately bigger fish because that's the nutrition side of bigger fish. So when you got your food chain going like that, and then you stock your game fish, here we are about one year, year and a half. Now we're at about close to two years, two and a half, three. So once we get to three years, they start to kind of even out. And the main reason is because the, 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 the game fish start to reproduce. So when they start to reproduce, then their babies get involved in the game and it's lights out. They'll start taking, they will take this food chain from here to here unless you've got a good harvest plan. That's another trade secret, although it's really not, to growing bigger fish. You've got to do some harvesting. You know, look at a pond, I've said this before a hundred times, look at a pond like you look at a garden. At some point you're going to want to harvest it. Hey, there's Maceo checking in from Atlanta, Georgia. Good to see you, Maceo. Let's see, Christopher Aguilar checking in. Yo, yo, hello. John Henry 10, yep, you got it, John. You guys know, you guys know this stuff. You ought to be teaching, not me. So let's see what's going on here. I need to scroll down and see some more comments. I see John Mikulik, Kyle McKean. Are you watching the weather? No, I'm not watching it, I'm in it. <laughs> it's kind of crazy, boy. I'm, not, I'm surprised we had any giant thunderbolts here in the last five minutes that this show's been going on. Uh, the weather's pretty pretty rigorous up here, Kyle. Uh, Kyle's got a place just up the road here, just a little ways up between uh, Gordonville and the lake, and he's got a really nice pond on it and actually built another pond. We need to put some fish in that. Now's the time to do that. All right, so now you got your bait fish going. By about year three, you're here. And by about year three, what you do, here's a trade secret, what you do in year three is going to determine or be a key determining factor on how big your fish get ultimately. I mean, you, I don't know how many times you guys have heard this, probably a lot. The uh, Christopher Aguilar may be moving to Alaska. Oh yeah, I'll give you some info on cold ponds. Uh, invite me up, we'll go, we'll go salmon fishing and we'll talk all about it. I love that kind of stuff. So by year three, that's, that's a, that, here, here, this, this is a trade secret. By year three, you better be monitoring reproduction of your game fish so they don't overeat your bait fish. And by that time, by year three, you're almost halfway through your first bluegill's lives. So, you know, a, a brand new pond that's stocked, and somebody, somebody mentioned this to me yesterday. Uh, it's, uh, it was Steve Woodruff down in Athens. He's got a 30-acre lake, and he's disappointed that it's not producing more fish. And he made the comment, and she says, you know, Everybody I've ever met that had a new lake by about years four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, through those years, fishing is great. But after that, it starts to change. It starts to deteriorate, which is true. Most lakes become what they're going to be by about year nine or ten. But it's what happened in year two, three, four, and five that determine what's going to happen in year nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. And that's got everything to do with the genetics you stocked in the beginning. It's got everything to do with the way you manage your forage fish. But even more so, it's got everything to do with how you manage your target fish. Target fish may be bluegill. They may be red ear sunfish. 
in the bigger lakes may be crappie. I don't know. It may be um, it may be largemouth bass, maybe smallmouth bass, whatever your target is. So you've got to keep in mind at all times you got to have the best habitat for all sizes of all species of your key fish. Like with largemouth bass, that's bluegill, red ear sunfish, threadfin shad. And by producing the food that they need on a continual basis, that's going to help you figure out how to grow the biggest fish you can grow with good genetics and then a selective harvest plan. All right, let's see here. I see Liz Adams. Hey, Liz. Hi, honey. Good to see you. Let's see here. Leanne's checking in. Leanne, let's have a drawing next week. I forgot about it this week. Don Brule from Central Louisiana. Ain't no crawfish down there. Chad Gillespie, what's the largest fish taken from a pond or lake that you've managed from the beginning? Uh, the largest largest bass would be 13 pounds, 7 ounces, and I've had three of those. Uh, three pound, 4 ounce bluegill, and there's probably been four or five of those. Um, I don't know, uh, red ear, probably 14 inches long, and two and a half, two and three quarters. We didn't weigh that one. I've, I've only seen one that big. I've seen a lot of 12 inch red ear sunfish. Hybrid strippers, over 12 pounds. Um, buffalo, 50 pounds. <laughs> didn't do that on purpose, by the way. All right, so Sonny Mitchell says, I've got a fertilized bass crowded, five acre bass bluegill shellcracker pond near Auburn, Alabama. I have an order for one load of threadfin shad in the next two weeks. Will they spawn this late? Absolutely, they will. Uh, threadfin shad are ongoing rolling spawners. So here's the way threadfin shad work. Now, if you're gonna if you're gonna be successful growing a species of fish, you have to know how they work, and a lot of it is determined by timing. So when you're putting these threadfin shad up, it sounds like you're getting them from American Sport Fish Hatchery. I highly endorse them. As a matter of fact, they bought out my my Bob Lusk Outdoors Pond Management business. So now they've got a presence, pretty big presence in Texas. And I love those guys. They know what they're doing and they raise great fish. The threadfin shad that they deliver are, are viable, eggy, ready to go. Now, got to remember, threadfin shad lay their eggs on grassy substrate. So if you've got some aquatic plants, bushy pond weeds, good. If you've got some uh, primrose, uh, if you've got plants that are in water six inches to 10 inches deep, they will stick their eggs all over those. And then when the babies get to be about 45 to 90 days old, depending on the weather, they start having babies. But now you won't see any baby threadfins probably until about July because they're going to go out into the middle of the lake and they're going to feed. Now here's how they feed. They're filter feeders. Threadfin shad are filter feeders. They gain all their nutrition from the, by gleaning, gleaning it from the water column. So you got to have substrate for them to spawn on. If you don't have any, if you don't have any bushy pondweed, American pondweed, any plant life under the water, get some uh, hay. Coastal Bermuda hay is excellent. Alfalfa is okay, and spread that. Break it out, spread it out, put it along the shore. Thread fins come in about 30 minutes before daylight, and they go till about 30 minutes after daylight. They're coming in. You can see the bass blowing up on them as they're spawning along the shed, the shoreline. So if you'll give them structure and make sure they've got fertile water. A plankton bloom where the visibility depth is 18 to 24 inches is great to grow threadfin shad. So that's a good way to do that. Will they spawn this late? Yes. I also have a brim feeder. That's good. And actually, little baby threadfin shad will come up around a feeder and they'll feed there unless it's too busy for them to come. Then they'll kind of hover around the dock and they'll, and they'll pick out of the water close to the dock. I also have a brim feeder fishing now and have a stringer of 10 inch bass. <laughs> taking all I can. They're all skinny and the same size. Man, you need to be calling those call, 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 call. Now, if you have an overcrowded bass lake, water's not fertile, and you don't have a place for threadfin to spawn, they're not going to succeed. So you got to you got to know these kind of things. Threadfins that, that are going to be coming in, in a load are going to be about, oh, so long, two to three inches, maybe four inches or so. And those threadfin shatter a year old, and they're ready to spawn. And they will. So... Let's see here. Let me scroll down here a little bit, see what we got. Can you, Kyle says, can you stock fatheads way in advance? Yeah, you can. You can stock fatheads way in advance of the rest of the fish. Yes, you can. Now, here's something to be careful about. If you don't stock your pond and you're in a watershed where there are other ponds, nature will stock your pond. We electrofished last week a lake, 
I guess we did it on Thursday, a big lake that a guy built three years ago. He was positive there was no fish in it. Let's see, wait a minute. He built that lake, had to have built that lake in 2015, never put any fish in it. And we put the, the shocker boat in, we weren't out there 30 minutes, and we caught 120 bass from about six to 12 inches long and four that were two and a half to four pounds. So now there's no food in it, and it's a big lake. It's like 80 acres. So now he is upside down from the very beginning because he didn't stock it early on. If he had stocked it early on, we looked at another lake that we had stocked in 2014, and that lake's in great shape. It's at the point where he needs to be harvesting some fish out of it, you know, which is pretty normal because now it's starting year five. So that, that lake needs some of the young of the year fish harvested from it, which is a key backbone factor in trying to grow big fish. You got to harvest fish. Now it kind of it kind of depends on your goals. If you want to grow big bluegill, then we're going to talk differently about which fish to harvest. You want to keep some small bass in there to keep bluegill reproduction down. So if the goal is to grow big bluegill and that's the goal, then you got to keep your bass crowded enough to keep the bluegill from populating so heavily that they compete for space and food. That's kind of a trade secret out there. All right, so now then, um, Christopher Aguilar, I caught many two-inch green ear sunfish. That's probably green sunfish. Yep, well, those uh, green sunfish spawn once a year. Bluegill spawn several times. Green sunfish have a bigger mouth than bluegill, so they can compete higher up in the food chain. So they can eat things that bluegill can't because bluegill's mouth's not big enough. So knowing little bitty things like that, that can help you be a better pondmeister. Let's see here. Um, Brian, Weatherwork, my, Brian Merriweather says, how soon should I start? How soon should I start harvesting a hybrid bluegill? Uh, Brian, I'm going to tell you by about year four or five. Now the thing is, if your goal is to grow big bluegills or big hybrid bluegills. You want to preserve the best of the best. Hey, David, David Fig, good to see you, man. How's everything over there in Georgia? John Wilson checking in. Steve Lewis, hi, Steve. Let's see here. Um, Jason ordered spiral eelgrass online. That's good. Here we go. Uh, Chris Dobbs, Karen Wusher. Hey, guys. Um, so, when should you start harvesting hybrid sun? Hybrid sunfish. Got to keep in mind. There's Drew. Hey, hey, is Maddie with you, dude? Just kind of wave at me. Hey, Maddie, good to see you. Mark Sanders checking in from the Tyler area. Man, we got guys from all over the country. All right, so Brian Merriweather wants to grow giant hybrids. All right, well, the uh, way to do that is I would feed them. Feed them a good high-protein fish food. Start off, if they're about so big, start off with Aquamax MVP. That's nine different pellet sizes. What, there's several things I love about that fish food. First of all, it's fish meal-based. It's got nine different pellet sizes and about 20, 25% of the pellets sink slowly through the water column because the most aggressive fish are gonna come up and eat first at the surface and just boil the water. But that's a percentage of the fish. There are other fish that are more passive or even less aggressive, if you wanna look at it that way, that will feed underneath those fish that are aggressive if they get the opportunity. That way you can feed the others, you know? And so, um, Let's see here. All right, I'm gonna stay on track. I'm reading these comments. I'll come back to you in a minute. Hey, Josh Flowers, good to see you, man. So uh, on feeding those hybrids, I'm gonna tell you about 20 to 30% of them will have the aggressive nature and the genes to grow bigger than the rest of their siblings or the rest of the batch. And that's gonna have something to do with you. There's an emergency, just got an emergency alert for the weather. We're about to have a flood. Speaking of flood, there's Chris Blood from Texas Hunter. We love Texas Hunter. Good to see you, man. Uh, Scott Hohenzee checking in from Purina. I was just talking about MVP. These guys are feeding some hybrid bluegill, Scott. And what I'm telling them is feed MVP. And then once, once you start to see, once the fish start to reveal which ones are the most aggressive and the faster growing ones, Start switching your feed up. Go to a larger feed. I start mixing some Aquamax 500, some Aquamax 600 for the bigger fish. So 
You want to feed the feed that fits in the mouth of the fish you're feeding. That's one of the trade secrets. A lot of guys don't think about that. And you know, and I was talking to some guys yesterday. Actually, I was at a fishing club. When was it? Thursday or Friday, I guess. I guess it was Friday of last week. And this lady was there. She says, oh my gosh, I feed my fish every day. Feed them by hand. I said, really? What do you feed them? She says, dog food. So I said, what do you feed your dog? Fish food? You know, feed a good feed if you want to see good results. So that's a smart thing. That's one of the, quote, trade secrets. Feed a good feed. Now, what will happen sometimes is you'll go into your dealer and you'll say, hey, I want, I want a bag of Aquamax fish food. And they'll write it up and it's, it's uh, $17.50. And then you get there around back where they load the truck and they stick some grain-based fish food from a company you've never heard of. Well, those dealers, a lot of times, they don't really understand what fish food is. They're looking at price point, what they can store and sell fast. That's what they're trying to do. Your goal is to get the best fish food to accomplish the goals that you're setting for your fish. So push that dealer into buying the feed you want. Place the order. Uh, if you know you're going to buy some feed, go in there a week ahead of time. Place the order. Purina orders happen every week. Now, they don't back order anything. They don't do that. But you you go tell your feeders, this is what I want, and have them order it. And if they can't, if they can't or won't, go find another dealer that will. If you have any problem with that, let me know or Scott Hohensee. Scott will help. Let's see here. I saw some other folks checking in here. Dave Weber. So, Bob, on that overstocked, underfed lake, do you use the shocking boat to remove excess bass? That's a good idea. Uh, now, of course, you have to pay for that, but what's it worth? You know, and, and uh, you know, I, I was talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago, and I've got a line that I use all the time. This guy wants to build about a 14-acre lake, and he was asking me what it was going to cost. Just looking at an aerial photograph and spending the time, a little bit of time on a contour map and driving around with him on it, I said, you know what? This damn site looks pretty good. And I started kind of running the numbers a little bit, and I said, you know, that's probably going to be a sixty to $70,000 dam. Now, that doesn't count building the core trench. That doesn't count doing the sculpting things that we need to do inside the basin of the lake to create habitat. But you're probably going to be looking at eighty to dollars to $100,000 to build a 14-acre lake. And he goes, ooh, wow, mm, that's a lot of money. I said, have you priced a bass boat? Price a tricked-out bass boat, eighty grand, and you're not going to pull it with that pickup. You know, you can spend 130 grand on a truck and a boat. You know, it's going to lose value as soon as you drive off the lot. And when you build that 14-acre lake, that's value added to the property. Well, the, the point that I'm trying to make here, same thing with fish food. Get the good fish food and get a good feeder. Texas Hunter is real good. Now, on shocking the, using the shocker boat, depending on who you work with, I know that American Sport Fish, to harvest bass in a pond, and not not do a survey, not write a report, but just to come and harvest bass working with their schedule, they'll do it for like 500 bucks on a lake that's within 100 miles of home. And that's pretty good value because what they're doing, what the electrofishing boat does, and this is one of the trade secrets that you need to know. If, if you allow harvest by an electrofishing boat or with an electrofishing boat, you are randomly selecting the underperforming bass and taking out those fish that are not growing very well and not getting the size they need to be. Whereas if you depend totally on catching or catching them, you know, fishing for them, you're going to be calling the most aggressive fish six or you're six or seven years down the road. You're 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 and, and that's a that's an inherited trait. So if you call your most aggressive fish and you're four, five, six, seven, and eight by year 10, 11, 12, 13, when you're way into it and you got a little gray in your beard. You know, by that time, you're going to be seeing, oh, my catch rates are going down. And it's all because you've harvested the wrong kind of fish. You know what Bob, he says, uh, Chris says, you know what, Bob, got to have Texas hunter fish food. Yes, you do. You know, and, and sometimes I was talking to a guy today, and he says, man, those, 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 that feed is high, and those feeders are high. He had a little sticker shock. So I said, well, let me tell you something. Texas hunter has the best product on the market. I've got some Texas Hunter feeders in my clients or on my clients' lakes that they've had for 10 years, and all they've done is replace a battery every four or five years. You know, and so, and, and, and when you call and order that battery, you got it the next day or within two days. 
Customer service is great. Products are great. Yeah, you're going to pay for it, but you're going to get what you pay for. So, good fish food, Purina's Aquamax products, takes us under feeders. I totally believe in them. I believe, not only do I believe in the product, I believe in the people. And that's a big deal to me. I want to believe in the people. Let's see here. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit there. Sheridan Ashmore, good evening. Howdy. Let's see here. Joseph Reynolds checking in. Shannon Kane's checking in. Dick Tabbert. John Krause checking in. Hey, John, my garden's starting to grow. I'm not going to send you pictures yet because everything's about like that. Once it gets about like that or that, then I'll start sending some pictures. We are eating some asparagus, though. Let's see. Uh, Sheridan Ashmore. I know it's kind of off topic, but here in South Georgia, can chain pickerel shift where the bass are located, similar how it is up? Can pick chain pickerel shift? Well, I'll tell you this. I like chain pickerel. Uh, most of the time, chain pickerel live up in vegetation in fairly shallow water, typically. Uh, do they compete with bass? Yeah, they do. Uh, I don't see them as detrimental to a bass fishery unless they get crowded. I haven't seen that. You know, now, once a chain pickerel hits about four pounds, yeah, it's going to be eating some other fish. You know, so, yeah, yeah, they can, they can, be, um, they can be competitive they can, uh, but I've not seen them disrupt a good bass fishing lake. On the contrary, sometimes I think they can help it. You know, especially if they'll eat little bitty bass, which they will. And of course, they don't just say, hey, that's a bass, I'm going to eat it, and that's a bluegill, I'm not. They're going to eat it. But it doesn't take long of weighing and measuring fish and monitoring your bait fish population to know if some fish are, are, are being a detriment to your fishery. And Kanye checking in. I got a feeling that uh, Bruce is hanging out with her today. Glad to see you guys checking in. Okay, so what about some more trade secrets about growing bigger fish? Well, if, you, if you've watched any of these broadcasts, you know that I harp on habitat. And you know that it takes 10 pounds, <clears throat> excuse me, 10 pounds of bait fish to grow a pound of bass. Well, since you know that, then one of the, one of the secrets is preserving your bait fish long enough for them to become a significant source of food and having an ongoing population through reproduction. Here's what I mean by that. Now, that's kind of a trade secret that you got to wrap your brain around. When I'm managing a lake to grow big fish, I'm going to stock it to where we can get a huge advantage with the bait fish before we ever add the game fish. And then in year one and two, it's a matter of just letting them do what they do. Make sure the feeder's going. Make sure that the fertility's right. Now, Bruce Kanye is going to wince when I say fertility right, but he knows what I'm talking about. You know, in the south, you need fertilizer. Up there in the north where he is in Montana, he's taking it out of the water because he got too much of it. You know, and, and that's what you got to do. Your area, you need to know your area. But then you, you've got to have the fish that play the role and can perpetuate the food chain in your lake. So what I mean by that is, is fathead minnows jobs and sport fish ponds where largemouth bass are involved, they have one role. That role is to jump start the lake in the beginning for the first two years. Bluegill are the backbone of the food chain in a largemouth bass lake. Now Bruce Kanya manages for um, smallmouth bass, I think. He's got a lot of yellow perch. He's got some crappie up there and lots of bluegills, and he's got pumpkin seeds, he's got sticklebacks, but his Floating Island International products are designed to where he can perpetuate fathead minnows there. But I would pretty well bet you if he had very many largemouth bass, those fatheads would go away unless there's another source for them to come in. So now, let's see here, I'm going to scroll down. I'm kind of getting off track a little bit. No, I, I want to go back to this topic. Each one of these game, uh, forage fish plays a different role. Fathead minnows jump start the, the pond uh, for a bass leg. Bluegill of the backbone. Red ear sunfish, they're an important insurance policy. If you can stock tilapia in a lake, and if it's legal, they might play a role. Threadfin shad play a role. For growing trophy largemouth bass, gizzard shad play a role. Big bass have big habits and gizzard shad grow large. So one of the tricks, one of the trade secrets is to manage your food chain where it's perpetual and not cyclical. Think about that. You want to manage your food chain where it's perpetual rather than cyclical. Cyclical means that you have a spawn 
It gets eaten fast. Then three weeks later, there's another spawn from something else. It gets eaten fast. If you've got places that those little bitty fish can hide, a newly hatched baby bluegill, 12,000 of those weigh one pound. If you can keep them alive for 45 days, they weigh 30 per pound. You can do the math on that. You know, and when you start looking at the different fish, golden shiners may play a role, maybe they don't. That's part of what you got to figure out with these little trade secrets. So you got to have the right kind of habitat for all these different fish that you're thinking about. You got to have a perpetual rolling spawn. You got to manage for that the best you can. You have the right genetics if you want to grow bigger fish. If you don't have good genetics, it doesn't matter. You know, and, and, and you got to have the right food chain all the time. And then you got to have a good harvest plan. Now harvest, the harvest plan, what that does is that reduces the numbers of mouths to feed so you can increase the amount of food for the remaining mouths. Selective harvest is one of the trade secrets. That's getting more people are beginning to understand that. You know, used to the biologists and a lot of biologists still tell you, well, if you'll go cull all the bass 14 inches and under from your lake, at some point you'll start to see bigger bass. But what I'm going to tell you is if you catch a 14-inch bass that looks like an Alabama deputy sheriff like Mark Dobernose, then you're taking a fish out that could be on the junior varsity headed to the varsity, headed to the NCAA, headed to the NFL. So be selective about what fish you take. Let's see here. Um, holy cow, I'm like, ooh, there's a bunch of things catching up. All right, let's see here. Holy cow, Sheridan Nash, more interesting because I caught my first one last Saturday. Yeah, those those green sunfish are real, real aggressive. Real aggressive. Let's see, Christopher Aguilar, you were supposed to tell me how to build a pier in, ex in an existing pond. Okay, we'll tackle that one of these days. Keep reminding me. <laughs> Brent Rutan, hi, Bob. My pond is shaped like a fly rod. Huh, okay. About one acre of straight creek with about a half acre of deep circular pond. Okay. If I had a feeder in the pond area, will it service all bluegill? Or would I need to add another feeder toward the top of the creek? I'm going to tell you, one feeder will service the pond. Now, what you need to do, though, is set that feeder to go off about three times a day for just a few seconds. Now, if it's a Texas hunter feeder, set it to go off for four seconds, three times a day, and have those times about two and a half or three hours apart. Because the first fish will come in, they'll eat till they're full, then they'll go home. Then the next batch will come, then the next batch will come. I think you can attract most of them out of the creek because they're kind of going to want to be around that open hole anyway. Let's see here. Um, Brian Merriweather, Mary, how often do you set a feeder to feed for bluegill? Three times a day. This time of year. Now you switch it based on when it gets, if it's hot and, and their aggressiveness slows down, if you just from time to time, monitor the feeder when it goes off and you'll see. And, and what'll happen is at one of those settings, oftentimes if you got a setting in the middle of the day, they're not as aggressive at that feeding as they are in the morning and they are late in the afternoon. So if you want to eliminate one as they stop coming so heavily to the feed, then, that, then you can do that. But watch how much they eat and adjust your feeder and feeding times based on consumption. That's a big deal. Let's see here. Sheridan says, the Oak Mulgee PFA I told you about a while back has exploded with new habitat and forage two years after they drained the lake and fixed it in. Yeah, that's just, that's stunning. And I'm thrilled to death that people are doing that, especially in public waters, because if, if you can afford to drain a small public lake like that and fix it, create some new habitat, it, it gives it a brand new life. I mean, it can take a 50, 60 year old lake and turn it into an infant. You know, in five, six, seven, eight years down the road, it's gonna be an outstanding lake with huge potential. Now, of course, it's gonna be subject to harvest. If you got a lot of meat fishermen coming out there raping and pillaging it, it'll go down in three years. I mean, Lake Falcon, uh, good gosh, there was, I don't know, four or five years in a row that there were some huge bass come out of the lake, but on the Mexican side, it's legal to run gill nets, you know, because Mexican fishermen are fishing commercially so they can catch fish to sell to eat. Well, when that happened, they pillaged that lake and the, and the quality of the fishery declined. Now, it's still a pretty popular lake because it's huge 
and there's still some good fish in it, but it's not like it was because it got over harvested. Let's see, Mark Dumas, hello from Central Wet, Texas. Man, I tell you what, there's a line of storms. It's right on top of us. It's about to pass us, I hope. Jacob West, I've heard you say all ponds managed for large, largemouth bass always have large bluegill. Can you explain how that happens? Yeah, that's a, I meant to say this earlier, <coughs> but um, there's two ways to try to grow really huge uh, bluegills. And if, you'll, if you watch this video again, I did choose my words pretty carefully. One way to grow big bluegill is to have overcrowded bass. That's one way where I've seen guys now. That is if you're targeting big bluegill. If that's your goal, big bluegill, you want to do it with overcrowded bass to minimize reproduction success of those bluegills. So you can take a few bluegills, the best of the best, and they can get big. A second way to do that is to manage for trophy largemouth bass. If you've got a trophy bass fishery, and let me explain what that means. A trophy bass fishery is one where 25 to 30 percent of the biomass of bass weighs four pounds and up. Now, when that happens, you have enough big fish, they're doing a lot of your culling for you. And if you've got, you know, four or five, eight to 12 pound bass per acre of water, they're culling the bigger bait fish, which includes 10 to 12 inch bass. It includes bluegills eight inches and smaller. So just from attrition, having trophy largemouth bass, you're going to grow some huge bluegills. But keep in mind, you need to feed them. The more you feed, the better results you're going to get with these bigger fish, or to grow bigger bluegills especially. Let's see, Bill Russell. Hi, Bob. I have an extreme algae bloom in my one-acre pond. Would you recommend something like Qtream Plus? Visibility is 14 inches. Bill, you got to remind me where you are, and when you say algae bloom, I'm going to presume that you have sechi disc visibility where the water's green and 14-inch visibility, or are you talking about filamentous algae? Drop me a real quick note and let me know that, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on it. But I'm going to answer you this way. if When you say you have an extreme algae bloom, if that water is kind of an olive color, leave it alone. For now, I mean, here we are, first of May, and it should not be so hot that you're going to have a problem. So I would say, don't worry about it right now. Because that bloom is actually helping you, if, if that's what it is. All right, let's see. Shannon Guidry is going to tell Ashley A. Will Williams about us. That's good. Top fan, Chuck Brinkman. I left quite a bit of the cattails in various places around my pond go. I also toss some Aquamax 400 grower around those spots when I feed the rest of the fish. Seems to help preserve and grow bait fish. That's a good strategy there, Chuck. And what Chuck's doing is he's, he's reading his pond and he's seeing that some fish, little bitty fish, aren't really coming to the feeders. And he wants to be sure that they get to graze too. So he's going to them and he's throwing some little bitty tiny pellets. That Aquamax 400, that's a fish food that hatcheries use. Tiny little bitty pellets. You know, small enough that a, a three-quarter inch bluegill can eat it. You know, so that's a good that's a good strategy because what you're going to do is expedite growth rates for those fish that find the feed and come out of the cattails. Because when they come out of the cattails and they're bigger, then you're going to see them start coming to the feeder as well. Mike Cottrell says, uh, when first stocked my pond one and a half years ago, I made a mistake of putting crappie in. Forty of them in a three-quarter acre pond. I haven't caught one. Is it possible the bass ate them or they died out being a small pond? Wish you didn't put them in after watching your show. Well, time will tell that. You know, if you put them into an existing pond that had bass in it, I hope that they got eaten, which they, they sure could have. Let's see, Sheridan Ashmore, they pulled a 9.6 pound bass out of there. Just, that's great. That's great news. Tory Rhodes, this fall will my first, let's see, this fall will my first prawn stocking for bass from my four. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so I love that idea. Tor, what Tory's saying is he's got a small hatchery pond and he's buying freshwater prawn babies about that big and he's putting them in the water and he's letting them grow out and he's going to use them to feed his bass next fall. And there's some guys that are doing that and it's working pretty good. Uh, it's uh, it's getting a lot of publicity from you know based on the year and who's doing it. But that's pretty good. Let's see, Christopher Aguilar, the fish truck comes next week. Does it pay to add baby bluegill or will they get eaten? I don't know the answer to that, Chris. 
Christopher, I don't know the answer to that because I don't know what totally about what your fishery is all about. If you've got overcrowded bass and your food chain's out of whack, putting little bluegill in there, well, let's talk about the consequences of that. This could be a strategy. If you put enough in that 90% of them get eaten, but 10% of them grow up big enough to reproduce, that's a home run if you can't buy bigger bluegills. So you're not gonna hurt yourself, it's gonna hit you in the back pocket. You may spend 350 bucks on those fish and $30 worth of them grow up to be what you want. But that's good, that's not a bad thing. All right, so Sonny Mitchell, thank you very much for your advice. Hey, you're welcome. Bill Russell, South Alabama, green water, not bright green, 14 inch set, you just leave it alone. Don't treat it now. In May, that a lot of that's gonna be consumed, if not by shad or other fish, it's gonna be consumed by uh, zooplankton. They're gonna feed small bugs, they're gonna feed bigger bugs, they're gonna feed small fish, and a lot of that's gonna get converted into food chain. So don't treat it. Now, if this is the end of June and we're having this conversation, treat it. Because when the water temperature goes up and you've got a dense bloom like that, that's when it gets to be a problem. When your water temperatures are in the mid 70s like they are for you right now, not an issue. It's when your temperature jumps up into the 80s that it's really gonna be a problem. All right, Keith Mountie, Bob, I have a 17 year old lake, used to have big bass, been putting shiners in every year, took a bunch of little dink bass. Keep taking the little dink bass. The little dink bass are what stops you from having a lot of big bass. Remember this, this is a little, little trade secret. Once a bass hits 17 and a half inches long, that's about the size, it's about three pounds, that's about the size it can eat an eight to 10 inch bass. That's when it turns around and starts changing its food habits. A four pound bass doesn't act like a two pound bass. A four pound bass can eat a 12 inch bass. So one of your goals is to get as many bass as you can in the beginning to get to be 17 and a half inches and bigger. You do that by managing your food chain with rolling spawns of the different species of fish. You want multiple spawners if you can. That would be bluegills, that would be threadfin shad. Threadfin shad target, they're a target for 12 to 14 inch bass. So if you've got a bunch of bass stuck at 12 to 14 inches and you want to get them bigger than that, call the underperformers Use your thread fin shad because that's what's gonna take a 14 inch bass up to 16 inches. Then you gotta get it to 17 and a half. So that's all about the size of the food chain that you're trying to grow. So and I'm sitting there preaching this stuff to you. It sounds easy. If it was easy, the Texas State record largemouth bass would have been broken umpteen times since it was set last in 1992. Some of you guys were born after 1992. So it's not, it's not easy, but it's doable if you're conscientious and you're working at it and thinking about it. You can't, you, you can't just go and do a few things and then leave it be because it won't work like you want it to. All right, so uh, let's see here. Keith Mounty says, help. Okay, cold bass, manage your food chain. Shiners might be a good idea. They might not be. I don't know, might need to... Uh, Got big bluegills. If you don't, you need big bluegills. So we'll see. Mark Dumas, 26 acre legs, starting to show the invasive again. Put grass carp in five years ago, still has issues. What you may need to do, Mark, there with aquatic plants. See, I love aquatic plants as habitat for small fish and edge cover for big bass. I love that. But if more than 15 or 20 percent of your pond gets covered up with plants, starts to be kind of a detriment to anglers. Once it hits 40%, 50%, it starts to be detrimental to the fishery. If it hits 70%, look for a fish kill. That's gonna happen. All right, Jason Nipstad, we're planting spiral grass. Our concern is that we lower the lake four feet every year in January. Will this kill our grass? No, it won't. Because what'll happen is it'll go dormant in the fall and then it's tubers. When you see, you, you'll see it, it's got tubers. As long as those tubers stay moist and they don't dry out, they're going to be fine. Let's see here. Uh, Brian Merriweather, I love this show. Exciting stuff. It is kind of fun, isn't it? Mark Dumas, the lake is full of busters. Good. Chris Blood, Bob, how does a lake owner hire you to come out and write up a lake management plan? What's that process look like? I love you, Chris Blood. 
My wife tells me I got to promote myself, and I don't much. I did the other day. There's Morgan Tyler checking in with Purina. So um, uh, here's what's happened. I sold my pond management company, and we merged with American Sport Fish Hatchery back in February. So now I, I'm not managing employees anymore. I'm not making sure the truck's oils are ch oils changed, that the electric fishing boat trailer bearings are, are good. You know what I am doing now is I am consulting. I'm going out and helping you design the best fisheries program that you can have based on your goals and your budget. Now I'm taking on about 20 clients right now and I think I'm up to about 12 and I'm going to take on a few more, but what I really love to do that I'm good at is helping design brand new lakes or take existing lakes and how to refurbish them and make them great lakes. I'm not cheap, but I'm real good. You know, so um, if you guys are interested in, in me helping you, I'm happy to do it. If, if you want help, not me. Part of the reason I do Pond Boss stuff like this is we have got an array of advertisers. Matter of fact, We've got the resource guide this year. We do it every year. That's full of people we vetted and that I highly recommend. You know, so if you live outside of Washington, D.C. and Virginia, there's probably not much chance I'm going to be going over there to help you with a four-acre pond, but I know who will. You know, if you're living in the central part of Colorado and you need help with a trout stream, I'm probably not going to go do that, but I know who can. If you're looking to buy feeders, I know where to get feeders. You know, if you're looking for fish food, got it. Aeration systems, you bet. I can guide you to where you want to go, and I'd be happy to do it. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, Christopher Aguilar says he takes boudin and spam. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I gave a speech one time at a feed store, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't even talk to the guy about charging him. And at the end of the end of my talk, we were cleaning up, putting chairs up. I was helping him with that. We were just shooting the bull. This was up in Ardmore, Oklahoma, probably 10 years ago. He said, listen, I, I don't, we never talked about paying you. And I said, no, we didn't. He, so he reached over and he had this display of some dog food. He says, you have a dog? I said, yeah. Yeah, so he gave me a 40-pound bag of dog food. <laughs> so yeah, I'd probably trade for some boudin. I got, did some work at a winery in Napa Valley and traded some of that work for wine. So yeah, I'll, I'll do that. All right, so what are the trade secrets? The, the trade secrets are figuring out how to manage your water quality, your water chemistry with the right kind of habitat for the target species you want for year-round growth. Here's another trade secret that nobody talks about. You know, and, and I'm going to circle back on the feeding topic. You know, I'm a big believer in feeding fish to bolster their growth rates and to give them the chance to excel to their biggest sizes. That's a big deal. Uh, one thing we figured out with Richmond Mill Lake at Kingfisher Society, by the way, they sent me a picture of an eight and a quarter pound bass. It's a northern bass, feed train bass that was stocked in there about five years ago, but also makes a living as a predator in that lake because that's what they do. But eight and a quarter for a northern bass is really, really big. That's if you if you compared it, it would be comparing it to like a. Uh, 13 or 14 pound Florida strain largemouth bass, maybe even a little bigger. You know, a, a 10 pound northern bass, I've only seen or heard of a couple of those in my whole career. So that's uh, managing water chemistry, water quality. Think about this. If the water quality deteriorates for four hours a day with a rise in pH and a fall in pH because it doesn't have the alkalinity to buffer that pH change through natural processes of photosynthesis and respiration, you're missing eight hours a day of prime growing time for your fish. So how do you mitigate that? Check your water chemistry. Make sure that your alkalinity is 80 parts per million or better. Another way to do it is to use aeration as a strategy. You know, a lot of guys buy an aeration system just as an insurance policy to keep their water moving to cleanse it and oh, by the way, add some oxygen to it. You know, but aeration used as a strategy, you can help bolster that lake's ability to be stable and autonomous and healthy. And if you've got a good, healthy environment and those fish out there are not worried about where they're gonna get their next breath or, or why is the pH changing and they've got all this stuff going on in their body with their cells, you know, then you're gonna have a more stable system 
it's going to give you a longer period of time to give those fish what they need over a long term. Now, what I mean by that is if a fish doesn't eat today, it can make that up tomorrow. But if it doesn't eat right today, tomorrow, and the next day, it ain't making up that first day. It's got to have what it needs when it needs it. So that's one of the trade secrets. And if you're pretty uh, avid and ardent in your management, it's just like what Chuck Brinkman said a while ago, the comment he made about going around the cattails and pitching out a little feed, that could be the difference between a pound and a half bluegill and a two and a quarter pound bluegill and numbers of them in his Missouri pond in three years. I'll let that soak in for a minute. That little bitty touch that he's doing right now to feed his newly hatched bluegills could be the difference between having some pound and a half bluegills to two and a quarter pound bluegills three years from now. Now, here's what I'm not telling you. These little bitty bluegills right now aren't going to be two and a half pounds in three years. They'll be three quarters to a pound in three years. But the pressure that he's, that he's taking off the remaining fish by feeding these little bluegill and then bringing them into the system with his largemouth bass, his predators, combining all those forces are going to give him the best shot at growing some really big bluegills. And I can't wait to track that. Let's see here. Mark Dumas says, I have a huge bluegill society. Catfish and bass are huge. My issue is summer. Too water invasive vegetation. Well, now's the time to manage that vegetation. If it's starting to get out of hand now and you have a good plankton bloom, you can mitigate that. So what I'm going to tell you over there in Brownwood, Texas, Mark, is if you've got a good plankton bloom, oh, there's some thunder. We got a pretty good storm still going on. If you've got a, a plankton bloom, now of course uh, some, <laughs> something's going on right now over there where you are is we're getting a lot of rain and a lot of that's starting over there where you are in that watershed. So the more rain you get, the less you're going to be able to keep that lake fertile enough. You, water clarity. Here's the deal: water clarity is an issue. Now you can mitigate water clarity and fertility by using fish food, but in your case. If you can have a plankton bloom that's 18 to 24 inches thick visibility, then you, you can minimize the areas that those plants are going to grow. Now, using grass carp, that's a good idea, but it also depends on what kind of plant you've got, whatever the species are. You know, that makes a difference on, on their growth rates. It makes a difference. I mean, there's plants that actually will be pulling fertility out of the water. I mean, Eurasian water milfoil is notorious for that. Hydrilla does that, but I don't talk much about hydrilla because I don't see that in, in private waters very often. I think I've seen it three times in private waters in 40-something years. So that's what's going on. All right, so let's we're going to kind of summarize this. I got a granddaughter at dance. It's raining. I got to go get her. There's Carrie Martin checking in. We've been talking about aeration a little bit, Carrie. Dusty Allen joined in. Um, you guys are going to have to go back and watch it later because we're done. All right, here's here's the thing. Happy, healthy water. Healthy, healthy water with the right stuff in it, which includes oxygen, which includes um, the right kind of minerals, the right kind of nutrients. That, that helps. Autonomous and stable water chemistry helps give you better water quality, which gives you a stable home for your fish to live in. The right habitat, that's a big deal. That's the biggest deal after water. If you don't have good water, nothing else matters. All right, then one where guys fall down a lot is managing the food chain. You don't realize how fast your, your food chain can deteriorate. That can happen in three months if you're not paying attention to it. We've talked about genetics. You've got to have the right genetics, but that harvest plan is going to be the most simple thing that you can do ongoing. If you're proactive with a harvest plan, Check out Smart Fish online. There's an app you can load on your phone. Or you can, uh, Wade Bales, I've had him on this show before when we were in Memphis. Wade Bales, Quality Lakes over in South Carolina. The uh, Smart Fish app, you can load it on your phone and while you're fishing, weigh and measure a few fish. I, I, I know, I know what you're going to say. Hey, uh, 
if the fish are biting, I'm going to be fishing. And if I'm not fishing, I'm going to be popping open a beer. I get that. But we're having a conversation here, boys. Weigh and measure some fish. Plug them into that app. And that app's going to tell you, spit it out right. There are crappie. Golden shiners will. Bluegills will. If you have any fat minnows, they will too. All right, let's see here. Mark Newman says, what about depth? Uh, depth of plants or depth of visibility? The depth of visibility, you want it to be this time of year. Uh, we had a 14-inch visibility a while ago in May. I'm okay with that as long as, it in, as, as long as that visibility increases to about 24 inches by the 1st of June. So right now is the time to have a good bloom on your water. And that bloom should be 18 to 24 inches. That's ideal. Now, I've never met an ideal bloom. I've never met an ideal lake. Everyone's different. And what you've got to figure out are the nuances for your lake with your style of management that's going to get you where you want to go. And you know what? You can't money whip a lake. You can't force it to be something. It's not. You got to absorb what the lake's trying to tell you. Now I'm trying being a damn lake whisperer all of a sudden, but I've got one guy out of Childress, Texas, that's fertilized his lake five times and he's not getting a bloom. Well, that's because he's got 200 parts per million totally right out of the water, sequesters it on the bottom of the lake in 25 feet of water. So his alkalinity there in that case is too high, you know. So understanding that. You know, he's. I think he's going to keep adding fertilizer because until he can get a four-foot bloom. If he can get a four-foot bloom, he's going to be happy. You know, which he can probably do that. It's all a matter of how much fertilizer he's willing to, to put out there. All right, so now um, I'm going to wrap it up here. Hey, Casey, Carrie Martin hanging out with Tom Warman. I'm trying to make a living, you know, and so uh, it's uh, sometimes it's working, sometimes it's not. So I'll answer as many questions as I, as I get time to. If I don't answer you fast, don't get pissed, but I'll get to it because I got paying customers that are that are asking me questions. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. Hey, Pond Boss Magazine, $35 a year. Click like, put hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comments section and share this to your timeline. If you'll do that, you're going to be eligible for a drawing for Pond Boss hat and a mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. If you want a resource guide, let me know. If you want a sample copy of the magazine, drop me an email. Just drop an email to info at pondboss.com. There's four of us that will see it. Leanne will snag that. And she'll send you a sample copy of the magazine. Or better yet, just go online to pondboss.com right now and sign up for a $35 subscription. You think I'm good talking about it? Wait till you can read about it and go back and look at it again. Good stuff. All right, well, hey, it's that time to go. So uh, appreciate you guys checking in, joining me for this broadcast. It's always fun, and your questions are lively, and it's a pretty fast-paced hour. I can't believe we've already done an hour. So tell everybody about Pond Boss. Share what we're doing with everybody that you know that's got a pond. Just uh, help us out. We need some subscribers. We want to. We, and really, the mission is, is we want to help people be better stewards of their land and water, and we do that by conveying information. So if you'll put the word out, we'd appreciate that. And until next Wednesday, I'm going to tell you adios.